It is especially unique for me to be giving this talk here in Copenhagen, of all places. For those of you who know anything about quantum mechanics, or even those of you who don't but have heard the words, there's a famous thing called the Copenhagen Interpretation. Copenhagen, more than any other city in the world, has the right to be called the birthplace of quantum mechanics. But that would sound like it was good. However, from my point of view, the Copenhagen Interpretation is the enemy. Everything I'm going to be saying in this talk comes down to saying that the Co Copenhagen Interpretation is a terrible, terrible thing. So I'm sorry, people of Copenhagen, city of Copenhagen, Happily, we're in a small, autonomous, free town right now, so it's not so bad as it would have been if we were across the street. Let me explain why this is the case. I want to quickly explain what quantum mechanics is. It'll take a minute. Don't worry. There'll be a quiz at the end if you want any more cocktails. The way to understand quantum mechanics is to start with classical mechanics. You know classical mechanics. Isaac Newton handed this down in the 1600s. It's what we still teach our students today when they become beginning young physicists. And it's actually a very simple theory, no matter how much you might have been tortured with inclined planes and pulleys and so forth, okay? Classical mechanics says every object in the world has a state of being, which consists simply of where it is, its location, and how fast it's moving, its velocity. And if you know those things, where it is, where it is in space, and how fast it's moving, you can predict what will happen to the system. You can use this law of nature, F equals ma, you can solve all the problems. F equals ma is the only equation you need to solve problems in classical mechanics exams. It's a clockwork universe. If you know what's happening right now, you know everything about the universe at one moment, you can predict with 100% accuracy what the future of the universe will bring. It was so good, classical mechanics, that after Newton invented it, everyone figured classical mechanics was the truth, that the whole project of physics was simply deciding which version of classical mechanics was right. And then over a little over 100 years ago, quantum mechanics came along and messes everything up. So how does it mess everything up? The, if you teach people the rules of quantum mechanics, I'm going to tell you what we teach our students. I'm going to imagine it's exactly the same as you were a physics student, and you will be horrified. The beginning part is fine. This is Erwin Schrodinger over here. The beginning part of the rules are exactly in parallel to the rules of classical mechanics. In classical mechanics, objects, systems have a state, and there's some equations that tell you how they evolve, and that's it. In quantum mechanics, systems have a state. Now, instead of a position of momentum, the quantum state is a wave function. I'll explain what that is, but it's still some mathy thing. And then there's an equation. The equation is Mr. Schrodinger's equation, and that tells you how the state evolves over time. So far, so good. But if you were doing classical mechanics, you'd be done now. Those are the rules. And quantum mechanics does not stop there. Quantum mechanics, as we teach it to our students, the Copenhagen interpretation, tells us that we need extra rules in quantum mechanics to deal with what it means to observe, to look at, to measure a quantum system. So these extra rules say that you can only observe certain things. You cannot actually observe the state of the quantum system. You can only observe certain properties of it. When you observe them, you can't even tell what answer you're going to get. You can tell the probability of getting different answers. And there's another equation, the Born rule, named after physicist Max Born, that tells you what the probability is. The probability of getting any answer is the wave function squared assigned to that answer. And when you observe it, the wave function immediately changes to something dramatically different. It collapses, okay? These are the rules. I'm not making this up. These are the rules that we teach our undergraduates and that they're expected to know uh, if they be want to become physicists. The reason why quantum mechanics is so different than classical mechanics is this act of observation. And what it comes down to is the idea that what you see in quantum mechanics is very different from what there actually is. In classical mechanics, there's no such thing as 
interpretations of classical mechanics, it's perfectly obvious what's going on. There's some objects, there's a pulley, and there's an inclined plane, they're moving around. In quantum mechanics, we need to ask what the theory means. What does it mean to make an observation? How quickly does that happen? Why is it random? All of these questions. And it all comes down to the fact that you don't observe the system in its own self. What you can possibly see is different from what actually exists. What you can see are things like where the particle looks like it is, how fast the particle appears to be moving, but what exists is a wave function. So let me drive that home a little bit. Here's the classical idea of the world. Like I said, a particle has a position and a velocity. That's it. Pretty simple. Here's the quantum picture of the world. There is no such thing in quantum mechanics, which, by the way, is true. Quantum mechanics is correct, OK? There's no such thing as where the particle is. Sometimes you will be badly taught quantum mechanics, and they will say, you can't be certain about where the particle is. That's wrong. That is not the right way to think about it. The right way is that there is no such thing as where the particle is. What there is is a wave function, this cloud of probability. And it can be thought of as, for every single point in space, x and y, there's a value, there's a number. That's called the amplitude, the wave function's value, psi of x, at that particular location, OK? That's what the particle is in quantum mechanics. And if you can internalize that, if you can believe that and really think that that's describing reality, you're 90% of the way to understanding quantum mechanics. And then this crazy Copenhagen interpretation tells you that when you look at the particle, it goes from being spread out in x and y to suddenly collapsing at some position, OK? How likely is it that that collapse happens? It's proportional to the wave function squared. So in this graph, where the wave function is a big number, you are most likely to see it. Where it's a small number, you are less likely to see it. And there's a little equation telling you what the relationship is, all right? This is the recipe. This is the cookbook. This is the handbook for doing quantum mechanics that we teach our students and that they think is reality, but it's not. This story that we tell them is bizarre and crazy and horrible and obviously wrong. And it goes by the name the Copenhagen interpretation, OK? Sorry. Sorry, Copenhagen. The reason why it's obviously wrong is not because we don't like it, although we shouldn't like it. It's because it's not well defined. It's not a clean, crisp theory like classical mechanics was, like electromagnetism is, like general relativity is, where you know exactly what's going on at every single moment of time, at every single moment of space. In quantum mechanics, the way that we teach it, there's this idea of an observation. It's obviously hugely important. When you make that observation, not only do you get a result, but the system changes dramatically right away. So you ask yourself, well, what, what is it? What is an observation? What counts? Does it have to be a human being doing it? What if my cat looks at it? What if an earthworm looks at it? What if I just glance at it, like to the side? Does that count as an observation? How quickly does it happen? Is it really quick? Is it sort of gradual? Why do I get to follow the rules of classical mechanics when the system looks like it's quantum mechanical? And why are there probabilities at all? Why did the universe go from being deterministic like it is in classical mechanics, to suddenly stochastic and random, OK? It's because of these questions that there arose the field called interpretations of quantum mechanics. And back in the 1920s and 30s, this was hot stuff. People were talking about interpretations of quantum mechanics. Bohr and Heisenberg and Einstein and so forth. It has become disreputable to do this, OK? This is my major complaint about contemporary physics. And I'm going to phrase this in terms of my predecessor at Caltech, Richard Feynman. He's, he's, he's many people's predecessor, everyone who was there. Yes, you can clap for Feynman. So Feynman says, I think I can, please? I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. Now, this is a true statement if you interpret it in the following way. It's possible that somebody understands quantum mechanics, but there's nobody who everyone else thinks understands quantum mechanics, OK? There's nobody who everyone agrees, oh, yeah, that person understands quantum mechanics. 
I might understand quantum mechanics, but nobody thinks I do. So that's how you should interpret Fe what Feynman says. And you know what? That's fine. It's completely OK to say that we don't understand quantum mechanics, because after all, physics is about discovery. It's about discovering new things. We're supposed to be asking questions about the things we don't understand. That's the fun part of doing physics. Once you understand it, you put it in the textbooks and you move on with your life. So there's nothing wrong with not understanding quantum mechanics. What's wrong is that rather than taking this and saying, obviously, since quantum mechanics is the most important thing we know about reality, and we don't understand it, we should devote all of our best resources to understanding it. The people who study the foundations of quantum mechanics should be the academic superstars, given the highest salaries stolen away by major universities. That is not what happens. What happens is if you become interested in this question, you're fired. <laughs> you do not get a job in the physics department. Maybe you're lucky enough and you get a job in the philosophy department. <laughs> the way that I like to think about it is, you know the old fable, Aesop's fables, the fox and the grapes? The fox sees the grapes. The grapes look really juicy. The fox would like the grapes. So the fox jumps up and down trying to get the grapes, but they're too high. The fox cannot get them. So what the fox says is, you know, I never really wanted those grapes anyway. They're probably sour, OK? In the purpose, for the purposes of this parable, the grapes represent understanding quantum mechanics, <laughs> and the fox represents physicists. They tried really hard in the 20s and 30s to understand quantum mechanics. They failed. And bizarrely, they've convinced themselves that understanding quantum mechanics is not a good idea. <laughs> that makes no sense to me. You can honestly go into physics departments these days and say, well, you know, quantum mechanics is confusing. Feynman says nobody understands it. What are we doing to try to understand it better? They will look at you like you're from Mars, <laughs> like you're in the wrong department. So that's not going to be our attitude today. Today, we're going to try to understand quantum mechanics uh, the best we can. And where better to start than with Schrodinger's cat, OK? It's a famous thought experiment, the thought experiment stylings of Erwin Schrodinger. And it came up in correspondence in the 1930s with Einstein. Einstein and Schrodinger would, would I, I, I very nearly almost said email back and forth, but they would not do that. <laughs> they would write letters back and forth. It was a different time. But both Einstein and Schrodinger were convinced that quantum mechanics wasn't finished yet, despite having played huge roles in developing it. They lost the PR battle. And you will still today read people saying that Einstein was just too old and too much of a fuddy-duddy and too conservative to really keep up with quantum mechanics. In 1927, in the year that quantum mechanics really gelled, at the Solvay Conference in uh, Brussels, uh, Einstein was 48 years old. I'm older than that now. So I don't like this picture that Einstein was too old to understand quantum mechanics. And besides which, he wasn't. He understood it better than anybody. He just knew it didn't yet make sense, and he fought against that. But even Einstein and Schrodinger were not persuasive enough to let people know. So Schrodinger came up with this cat example specifically to make people realize exactly how weird and bizarre in quantum mechanics was according to the Copenhagen interpretation. So the way that it goes is you have a cat in a box. There is a radioactive source that gives out nuclear particles, radioactive uh, rays. It's detected by a Geiger counter. And that nuclear decay creating radioactivity is a fundamentally quantum mechanical event. There's a wave function, there's a probability, the whole bit. And Schrodinger says, if the detector goes off the Geiger counter and it detects a bit of radiation, it will open a box of gas, and the gas will fill the box, OK? Fill the whole box with the cat. Now, in the original thought experiment, the gas was cyanide. And the whole point was that the wave function of the radioactive atom would spread to the gas, and the gas would be in a superposition of having left the box and having stayed in the box. And therefore, the cat would be in a superposition of being alive and being dead. I see no reason to kill the cat, even in the thought experiment. So I, you notice I didn't say cyanide on there. Let's imagine that it's sleeping gas in the box, OK? So the cat 
goes into a, evolves into a superposition of being awake and being asleep. This is a true fact. A friend of mine once talked to Schrodinger's daughter, and she said, I think my father just didn't like cats. <laughs> we can undo the historical damage right here and right now. What Schrodinger was trying to teach us it wasn't just like, ooh, quantum mechanics is spooky, okay? He had a point to make, namely the quantum mechanics couldn't be believed at face value. If you were doing classical mechanics, the way they were all thinking in the early 20th century, they had just gotten out of the 19th century. In the 19th century, they invented statistical mechanics, where you talk about the air in this room and you say, look, I don't know the position and velocity of every single atom or molecule of the air in this room, but that's okay. I can have a probability distribution for what the air might be doing. That's more than good enough for various reasons. What Schrodinger and Einstein and others thought was that quantum mechanics was like that. Was that, sure, now we can't make an absolute prediction for what we're going to observe, but that's just because we're just using this sort of fuzzy approximate description. There's probably something better underneath it. That's what they were trying to get at. So in that way of thinking, if you were classical, you would say, well, the cat is either awake or asleep. That's what cats are. But I don't know whether the cat is awake or asleep. There's some uncertainty. There's some epistemic lack. But there's a physical objective reality in the box. And what Schrodinger was pointing out is that quantum mechanics at face value says something very different. Once the box is in a superposition of having opened and not opened, the cat, as we said, evolves into a superposition of being awake and asleep. And this is a fundamentally different thing. It's not that we don't know whether it's awake or asleep. It is in a combination of both. Just like it's not that we don't know where the electron is in the atom, it's in a different kind of thing. It has a wave function. So that's the experiment. Let me illustrate how we might think about what it means. We're going to face up to this question. What's really happening? Okay, because in Schrodinger's picture, if you open the box and look at the cat, it suddenly changes. This is the textbook or Copenhagen version of quantum mechanics. It, according to the Copenhagen interpretation, I'm not making this up, okay, you treat the observer as a classical thing. Here's an observer played this time by Werner Heisenberg. The observer is not treated according to the rules of quantum mechanics. The observer is a big, macroscopic, classical object. And the tiny little quantum object that is being observed is treated by the rules of quantum mechanics. So notationally, quantum things are in parentheses. Classical things are in square brackets. Before you open the box, the cat is in a superposition, but the observer is classical. And then when you open the box, you make an observation, and the wave function of the cat collapses. Those are the rules that we teach our students. You don't know with perfect certainty what will happen next, but there are two possibilities. Either the cat is awake and the observer sees the cat awake, or the cat is asleep and the observer sees the cat asleep, with some probability in either case. That's the rules. Those are the rules of quantum mechanics. Nobody likes this. Schrodinger didn't like it. His, his conclusion of this argument was, Surely you don't believe that, even though he was partially responsible for it, OK? Well, it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. What matters is, is it a sensible physical theory that fits the data? Back then, it was. These days, we can do such a much better job at putting large objects that are clearly macroscopic into quantum superpositions that we have to do better than something like this. So let's. How can we do better? How can we do better than the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics? Like I said before, the first couple rules of quantum mechanics, there's a state and it evolves. Those are easy. Those we can do. Those are, make us happy. They exactly parallel the rules of classical mechanics. So what if all those other rules about observations and collapses and probabilities, what if we just erased them? What if we just said, the world is a quantum system, the world has a wave function, and the world obeys the Schrodinger equation. That's all that ever happens, OK? What would be so bad about that, really? Well, we can ask. We can ask this in the, con in the context of Schrodinger's cat. The trick is to treat both 
the system you're looking at and the observer as quantum systems. They're both in parentheses now, okay? So that's a little bit of a shift. You have to gird your loins for this. This is saying that you have a wave function. You obey the rules of quantum mechanics. It's not that crazy. After all, you're made of atoms, and everyone thinks that atoms obey the rules of quantum mechanics. Maybe you do too. So then you open the box, you measure the cat, and unlike the previous time, when there was an either or, the cat's awake and you saw it awake, or the cat's asleep and you saw it asleep, the rules of quantum mechanics are absolutely unambiguous about what happens. The Schrodinger equation tells you exactly what happens, namely, you evolve into a superposition. There is part of the wave function that says the cat is awake and you saw it awake, and there's another part of the wave function that says the cat was asleep and you saw it asleep, okay? Now, clearly, that doesn't sound right. Why doesn't it sound right for describing the real world? Because you and I, and every experimental physicist who has ever lived, never feel like we're in a superposition, right? We always feel like we see the cat, either awake or asleep. We never see it both. We never feel like I'm half seeing the cat awake and half seeing the cat asleep. So you discard this possibility for simple empirical reasons. It doesn't seem to fit the data. We seem to have a different result, okay? That's the puzzle that we have to face up with. That's the reason why people invented all of these extra rules. However, we've left one thing out of this analysis. I sort of slipped it in there under, under the, uh, in between the cracks, but it's a crucially important part of what quantum mechanics really says. In classical mechanics, when you have multiple things going on, the Earth, the Moon, the Sun, they all have their own state, right? The Earth has a position and a velocity. The Moon has a position and a velocity. The Sun has a position and a velocity. You might think that if an electron or a cat has a wave function, then in quantum mechanics, everything has a wave function. Turns out not to work like that. There is only one wave function for everything. We call it the wave function of the universe. Sometimes we're lucky enough that a little part of the universe, like an electron, is so separated out from everything else that we can act like it has its own wave function, but really there's only one wave function for everything. So we should include everything in the wave function. So we say there's the system being observed, in this case the cat, there's an observer, and there's everything else in the universe which we lump together and call it the environment. And if you do that, there's nothing crazy that happens. You just follow the rules as before. And what happens is you open the box, but even before you open the box, even before you did anything, the cat has already become entangled with the environment. Because the environment includes the light, the photons that are bouncing off the cat inside the box, the air molecules in the box. The environment is everything other than you and the cat. And many of these things you cannot possibly keep track of. You cannot keep track of the wave function or the quantum state of every single photon or molecule of air. So there's already been an interaction long before you open the box. And this interaction is called decoherence. Decoherence happens when a quantum system becomes entangled with the environment. The point is, if the cat is awake and walking around saying, get me out of this box, a photon might bump into it and be absorbed. Whereas if the cat is asleep on the ground, that photon would go right on by. The environment interacts differently with the cat if it's awake versus when it's asleep. Therefore, they become entangled. So by the time you open the box, the damage has already been done. Okay? Decoherence has already happened. The environment has already become mixed up and entangled with the cat. Who cares? <laughs> Why do I care about this? Why do we care what the rest of the world is doing? Well, because you might, we, the puzzle that we had is, why does the version of me that sees the cat awake never feel like they're in a superposition with the version that sees the cat asleep? You have to think about this, and the answer is, these two parts of the wave function of the universe, once they formed, never talk to each other ever again. Nothing that happens in one part of the wave function can ever have any physical effect on what's happening in the other part of the wave function because their environments have become separated. 
They become completely perpendicular to each other. There's no way for anything, any experiment being done in one part of the wave function to affect the other part of the wave function once decoherence has happened. So what has happened, in other words, is not that you have gone into a superposition of I see the cat awake and I see the cat asleep. What happens is the world in which the cat was in a superposition and you haven't looked at it yet has become two separate worlds, two completely distinct versions of reality, one of which says you saw the cat awake and the cat was awake, the other of which says you saw the cat was asleep and the cat was asleep, okay? This is inevitable. This is just the Schrodinger equation and the fact that there's stuff in the box photons, air molecules, whatever. And if there's not stuff in the box, there's stuff outside the box. It's a big world out there. It's going to become entangled with the cat. And what that means is that whether you like it or not, the prediction of the Schrodinger equation for quantum mechanics is that the world evolves into multiple worlds. So guess what? This is the origin of what we now call the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. It was invented by this guy, Hugh Everett, in his PhD thesis in 1957, after which he immediately left the field. He did not try to get it. He didn't even try. He was too smart. He knew he wasn't going to get a job as a physics professor after doing this. He went to work for the defense industry. So what he did in his thesis was very simple. All he did is take all those rules that were there and ugly about measurement and quantum mechanics, and he erased them. He didn't add anything in. There's no sense in which the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics starts with quantum mechanics and says, hey, there's a lot of worlds in addition. The worlds were always there. If you believe that an electron can be in a superposition of different states, then you should believe that you can be in a superposition of different states. And then you should believe that the universe can be in a superposition of different states. And the Schrodinger equation predicts unambiguously that you will get there that you evolve, will evolve from wherever you start into multiple copies of reality that do not talk to each other anymore and deserve the name different worlds. So in other words, if you want to know what's really going on, according to the many worlds interpretation, you know. It's the Schrodinger equation and wave functions. It's exactly what happens in every other version of quantum mechanics, but we don't add anything to it. It's been said that every other interpretation of quantum mechanics is a disappearing worlds interpretation, because the worlds are always there. Whatever it is doing is less physics and more therapy. He's saying it's OK that the worlds are there. The worlds are always there. Don't try to get rid of them. Just live with them. That is the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Now, admittedly, it is kind of a bizarre, radical, weird thing, right? To think that when a quantum mechanical event happens, that is to say, when a system that is in a superposition becomes entangled with the environment, the whole world splits. As much as I, like, uh, as much as I hate to be impolite to our virtual host, the video is not right. The world does not split when you make a decision. The world doesn't care about you making decisions. Make decisions all you want. What the world cares about is quantum mechanical systems and superpositions becoming entangled with their environment. But that's enough. There's plenty of times that that happens. In your body, there are 5,000 radioactive decays per second. So at every one of those nuclei that is about to decay, there's a choice. I decay or I don't decay. And guess what? That makes two worlds. So that doesn't mean 2 times 5,000 worlds are made. That means 2 to the power of 5,000 worlds are made just because of radioactive decays just in your body every second. So it happens a lot. If you want to use this to your advantage, and if, if you have an iPhone, I'm sorry about Android users, I can't help you, but if you have an iPhone, there is an app called Universe Splitter where if you have a tough decision, you know, should I get pizza tonight or should I get Chinese food, you can ask the app and it will send a photon that will go left half the time and right half the time in a beam splitter with a quantum mechanical probability, and it will create two different worlds. And it will come back and say, you're in the pizza world. <laughs> and then if you go have pizza, and then in the other world you actually do go have Chinese food, you will know for sure 
that there are two different realities in which you made the two different choices. Sadly, you can't talk to each other to compare notes after, but if the pizza wasn't very good, you might be able to console yourself with the idea that someone else got the Chinese food. <laughs> It's not you who got the Chinese food. You start as one version of you, and then in the future, there are many, many versions of you. Everett's analogy was with an amoeba splitting in two. They're not the same amoeba, they're not the same person after the splitting, they're just more and more descendants of you than you thought there were. If you don't like that, therapy, once again. It's not an issue for physics, it's an issue for you and your inner demons, okay? Now, because this is so weird, there are objections to it. Some of the objections are good, some not so good, all right, to be honest. So I originally titled this slide, Silly Objections to Many Worlds, but people got upset because many of them had these objections. So now I'm calling them misguided objections to many worlds. The most obvious one is there are just too many universes. I just don't like it that there are that many universes. I mean, two to the 5,000, which is about 10 to the 1,500, every second just in my body, surely there's not enough room for all those universes. That's not a very good objection. One is tempted to call it silly. The reason why is because the space of all possible wave functions is really, really big. You can calculate how big it is. It's plenty big to take all of these universes and fit them in. The other universes aren't located nearby. They're not located anywhere at all. They're simultaneously existing. But in every single version of quantum mechanics, There are wave functions that live in this mathematical abstract space called Hilbert space. And Hilbert space is plenty big to fit all the universes. I know it sounds like a lot, but physicists deal with infinitely big quantities every day. You shouldn't be afraid of all these universes. The second, oh, excuse me, the second misguided objection is that this cannot be tested, that it's not a falsifiable theory, because after all, You have all these other worlds and you can't see them. It's true, you can't see them, you can't talk to them, etc. So therefore, this objection goes, it's not a scientific theory. That is nonsense. Remember, many worlds is not the statement that there are a lot of worlds. Many worlds is the statement that there are wave functions and they obey the Schrodinger equation. That's it. These are extremely testable assumptions. Are there things other than the wave function? Are there hidden variables? Go out and look for them. Does the wave function do things other than obey Schrodinger's equation? You can test that as well. This is the most falsifiable theory ever invented. It is perfectly scientific. Those are the bad objections, but there are also reasonable objections, and that's why it's an ongoing research problem. So I think the one that has gotten the most attention, and the one that is still a little bit puzzling, although I think we basically know the answer, is why are there probabilities in many worlds quantum mechanics? So remember, the difference when you went from classical clockwork universe to quantum mechanics is that you can now no longer predict the outcomes of experiments with perfect accuracy. The best you can do is predict a probability. Whenever it comes along and erases those rules, he leaves you with a theory which is 100% deterministic. There's a wave function and it evolves, according to the Schrodinger equation, which is perfectly deterministic. You should be able to predict everything in this theory. How in the world is it that the best you can do for predicting experimental outcomes is doing a probability? I will tell you the answer in a second. But the other question is why does the world look even a little bit classical? Remember in the Copenhagen interpretation you thought that there was a classical world that was an important part of the theory and quantum systems were only tiny little things. Everett says the whole universe obeys the rules of quantum mechanics and yet in our everyday life or when we're teaching first-year physics students, we still pretend that it's classical. That's because classical mechanics is a really good approximation to the world we see. So why is that the case? This turns out to be a very hard problem, but thinking about it in the right way is leading us interesting places. So let me give you very, very quickly the two most reasonable answers to these questions. For probability, and this is again one of these sort of metaphysical shifts you need to make in your mind, You think about probability as something objective. You flip a coin, 50% of the time it's heads, 50% of the time it's tails. In Everettian quantum mechanics, probability is epistemic, not objective. 
We do know exactly what the wave function is going to do. We don't know where we are in the wave function. It's not that there is something unpredictable about physics. It's that there is something we don't know. That's why it's epistemic. Epistemic having to do with what you know. So remember, here's the cartoon of what happens. Here's the cat. Here's the environment. Here's you. You observe. You decohere. But decoherence happens before you open the box. That was a crucially important fact. And it is a fact. The time over which decoherence happens is less than a zeptosecond which is a very short period of time. The time that you have thoughts in your brain is milliseconds, which is short but way longer than a zeptosecond. So there's always a time in the evolution of the universe when there are two copies of you, exactly identical, and neither one of them knows which branch of the wave function they're on. You evolved from a state where you knew everything, necessarily to a state where there is something you didn't know, where you are in the branching of the wave function. And you can go through the math, you can check, and you ask, well, how should you guess? What are the probabilities you should assign to being on one branch of the wave function or another? Guess what? It's the wave function squared. It's the Born rule. It's exactly what the Copenhagen interpretation taught us all those years ago. So there is a way of dealing with probability. It's just that you have to admit that it's a probability for something you don't know, not for an objectively occurring feature of the world. The other question is much more interesting, and sadly I don't have nearly enough time to do justice to it, but this question of why is the world approximately classical? This gets tied up with the question of quantum gravity. You may have heard of gravity. It's what makes things fall, right? So Einstein, when he wasn't giving Bohr a hard time about quantum mechanics, invented our current best theory of gravity, general relativity. General relativity says that gravity is simply the curvature of space-time. As far as we know, this is exactly correct. We use it to send satellites around the universe to predict the expansion of space, things like that. But it can't be the final answer because it's a classical theory. General relativity is not compatible with the rules of quantum mechanics. And we've been trying for decades now to reconcile general relativity with quantum mechanics, to create a theory of quantum gravity, and I can safely say that nobody understands quantum gravity. Now, Feynman said, I can safely say nobody understands quantum mechanics. Maybe you shouldn't be surprised that nobody understands quantum gravity if nobody understands quantum mechanics. Apparently, no one has had this thought in the past 80 years because the fact that we don't understand quantum mechanics is considered irrelevant to the problem of constructing a theory of quantum gravity. I think it's not irrelevant. I think that understanding how quantum mechanics works is crucial to figuring out why there is gravity at all. And we can see the basic sketch of an outline for how this is going to work, even if we haven't put the entire thing together yet. We know there's this thing called entanglement, right? Two particles can be entangled with each other. Their quantum states can be related. You became entangled with the cat when you opened the box and observed it. Now, we also know that the best theory we have of particle physics is something called quantum field theory. You think of the world as empty space with a bunch of particles in it, right? Here's empty space, here am I. You know that's not exactly right because there's air, but if you went out in between the planets, it would be very, very close to empty space, right? Quantum field theory says that's not right. It says that what you and I think of as a particle is a vibration in a field that is pervading the whole universe. Fields are things that don't have a location. They have a value at every single possible location. Most of the time, they're just gently vibrating with zero energy Sometimes, if they start vibrating a lot, you see a particle there. And this little picture over here is supposed to indicate that these fields that are vibrating are highly entangled with each other. And they're entangled with each other in a very specific way. Regions of space that are nearby are very, very, very entangled. Regions of space that are far away are not that entangled at all. So let's imagine the following conjecture. Take that sentence I just said and run it backwards. Rather than saying there's a certain distance 
between these regions, and from that I can figure out how entangled they are. Let's say that what is real and fundamental and true about the universe is quantum entanglement. It's the wave function, it's the quantum system that is true after all. We generally try to construct theories of quantum gravity by starting with a classical theory and quantizing it. But nature doesn't do that. Nature doesn't start with the classical theory. Nature is quantum mechanical from the start. Let's admit that it's quantum mechanical and use words like wave function and entanglement and posit that what you mean by distance is how much entanglement there is. One over that, right? If there's a lot of entanglement, we call that nearby. If there's very little entanglement, we call that far away. So out of the quantum wave function, out of the entanglement between different parts of these vibrating fields, you can construct space-time, and in particular, you construct space-time with a certain geometry. And that's exactly what Einstein says gives rise to gravity. And you can ask yourself, again, go through the math. This is homework. You can read up later. If that's right, what is the equation that this emergent curved space-time should obey? Here it is. I know you've been waiting for this. This is the second most important equation in modern physics after the Schrodinger equation. This is Einstein's equation for general relativity. You don't need to know the details. They're fun to know. But on the left-hand side, it's how much curvature does space-time have. On the right side there is how much stuff is there, how much energy, how much pressure, how much momentum, and so forth. As John Wheeler put it, matter tells space-time how to curve. Space-time tells matter how to move. And I'm putting this up here because Professor Einstein derived it in 1915. But I'm also saying that you can derive it in a completely different way by starting with wave functions that are entangled in the right way and asking how they evolve over time. In other words, it may be that the right way to get gravity is not to start with gravity and quantize it, but to start with quantum mechanics and find gravity within it. That's what we are currently working on. So I will leave you with this thought from a famous physicist who is a champion of the Everett interpretation of quantum mechanics, David Deutsch. He said, despite the unrivaled empirical success of quantum theory, by which he means the many worlds interpretation, he doesn't admit that there are any other approaches to quantum theory, the very suggestion that it may be literally true as a description of nature is still greeted with cynicism, incomprehension, and even anger. So my hope is that over the course of tonight and a few cocktails, I have decreased your amount of cynicism and maybe even anger. Thank you very much.